So before we start, we want to kind of see how many people in here do play video games. Or do you know someone that plays video games? More likely than not. For those of you that probably don't, well, yeah, I'm Terrell. I'm Christian. And I'm Isaac. Um, and our research was kind of inspired by our professor, Dr. Allison, on his research on flow and rock climbing. So we chose to do our research on predicting flow, gratification, and enjoyment in video games. So in order to predict all these states, we need to have good, clear definitions of them. So first off, what is flow? You may hear this as typically like being in the zone, and this is applied usually to athletics, or you'll hear it most in athletics, but we're applying it to video games. It's different than just immersion, where when you're immersed in something, all of your focus is directed on the task. For example, if you're reading a book or watching a movie, you may be immersed in the task, but there's no control. You're not controlling what happens in the book or the movie. In order to be in a flow state, you need to have some control, which we find in video games. And typically, when you're in this flow state, you will lose track of time. So you may be playing for more than an hour, but it only feels like 15 minutes have passed. You make decisions unconsciously. So before your conscious mind may even be aware of what's happening, your unconscious mind has already made the correct decision. And typically, when you're in this flow state, performance does go well. So for our next definition was enjoyment, and this was a sense of pleasure gained from being in that moment. Um, and usually it's very temporary, and in this case, it only lasts while you're playing the video game. And gratification is very similar to enjoyment being a sense of pleasure, but unlike enjoyment, it's not during the game experience, but it's afterwards or before. So it's having that pride of uh, being able to play the game and reflecting off of your task completion and being able to beat the game. So it's, it's mostly just uh, not playing the game that's the, the gratifying moment. And so to predict these three, we were looking at video game characteristics uh, one of the first being reward features as well as punishments. And so getting new levels or getting new gear, progressing forward in the game for playing, that's reward features, but then getting the big game over screen for not being able to do something, that's your punishment. So for competition, we broke this down into multiple forms, being whether players play on their free time casually or if they play on a strict schedule professionally or if players play online with other human players, or if they prefer to play offline on a standard basis, story mode kind of deal. In addition to comp uh, for competition, we have opposition and team. So for some players, they play on a team-based game, or they could play a free-for-all, for instance, Call of Duty players, you can play against other people. And lastly, we consider playing solo versus playing multiplayer. Uh, and another Characteristic is visuals and audio, and how stimulating the game is towards, uh, visually and auditorily. Another aspect is character identification and how relatable and dynamic the character is that you're playing as, as well as customization being aesthetics or your gear or any type of mode within the game. And lastly is a characteristic we consider nostalgia, and some developers use uh, some type of theme from our childhood or from past video games and incorporate that within present games such as Star Wars or Super Mario Brothers. Uh, so for our next predictor we looked at personality and we used the big five and it has five different subscales. Uh, for neuroticism it's uh, being able to be emotionally stable. Um, for extroversion it's a lot about projecting your energy onto other people and kind of how you take that. For agreeableness it's being able to cooperate well with others. And uh, for conscientiousness, it's about self-discipline and achieving uh, tasks really well. And lastly, for openness, it's being uh, curious about the arts and other things like that. And then finally, uh, we also included from the Interpersonal Reactivity Index, which measures empathy. We took uh, one of their subskills, fantasy, and that's being able to relate with characters from books or movies, or in this case, video games. So we want to go over some of our hypotheses that we had coming into this research. We didn't have anything too specific regarding our video game characteristics, but we did expect that all to be positively correlated with flow, gratification, and enjoyment. And we pulled our characteristics from past studies also found positive correlations. So what we're really interested in is which one of these characteristics, along with personality, predicts flow, gratification, and enjoyment the best. So here's a few of the video game characteristics we are kind of most interested in that might do well. First off, is punishment features. I know when I'm playing video games and I have the threat of a punishment, I am more motivated to play well in my game to more states like flow. And also when it comes to the Zygernik effect, which is when you're um, more focused on like, tasks that haven't been completed and you kind of dwell on them, 
you might have higher gratification when you do eventually overcome that task. So if I'm trying to be a level in a game, and it's taking me a long time of dwelling on that uncompleted task, and once I do complete it, I may be more gratified and because of the punishment features. And then for nostalgia, I thought this could also be a powerful predictor. For example, games that incorporate Star Wars into them bring this really large franchise that has a really large following where people are loved and devoted to it into a video game. So you already have a lot of positive emotions towards the game before you even play it. So we thought nostalgia could have strong correlations with our three. And finally, competition, broken down to the CPU versus online. If I'm playing against a real person online, I am more motivated to beat them because I'm better than someone else, a real person, than I'm just playing the computer. I don't care too much if I beat a computer. And then for personality, um, fantasy was one of ours we were really interested in because you are relating to um, your characters in the game, and you might have more experiences of enjoyment and gratification because you have uh, high relation to the characters. And for conscientiousness, it's kind of, as Isaac said, related to like completing tasks. So we thought this might be correlated highly with gratification. So how do we measure all of these? So for personality, uh, we pull from the Big Five inventory, and we use this version of the Big Five inventory, which was shortened. We used a shortened version of the Big Five so that our survey wasn't too long. It wasn't overwhelmingly um, having like personality items in it. And we used the entirety of this version of the Big Five uh, so for the fantasy subscale, like Isaac said, it came from the <coughs> Interpersonal Reactivity Index. And we used the um, entirety of that scale. So all of our personality subscales had five items each. And then for gratification and enjoyment, these items came from the Games User Experience Satisfaction scale. And we used um, those items in their entirety from that scale. So we had five items for each of those. And for flow, we had a bit of a more emphasis on flow. So we pulled from multiple different scales and had more items for this scale. So if three came from that same um, game user experience satisfaction scale, but they came from the Grossman subscale. Then 11 items came from the more traditional flow state scale, but we had to modify some of those items to fit video gaming a little bit better. Then we had one item from the game experience questionnaire, so we had a total of 15 items for a modified flow state scale for video games. And so here are some various items that we use for our personality scale. And we rated each one on a 1 to 5 Likert scale between whether or not a player strongly agrees or strongly disagrees with each item. So for instance, we have the fantasy item that says, I daydream and fantasize with some regularity about things that might happen to me. And we were kind of rating uh, one's curiosity and sense of wonder. Another item was for extroversion, which was pulled from the big five. It says, I really enjoy talking to people. and we we're you know, rating a sense of energy versus uh, introversion, depending on the person. And one more example is neuroticism, which also came from the Big Five, is asking or saying, some people think I'm selfish and egotistical. And we're rating one person's sense of insecurity versus stability. And then here's some examples for video game characteristics. We didn't use full scales to measure the video game characteristics. We were more straightforward with how we asked them. and one or two items. So, for example, for reward features, we first asked, does your game actually include reward features? And we explained what they were to them. And then we asked them how much it motivated them to play. And then like for audio, we asked them how important audio is. For the gameplay itself, we kind of explained um, how in games such as Call of Duty, you may, might hear footsteps <coughs> around you, and that's really important to hear as well as to see. And then um, for character identification, we asked them how much they identify with the character you are controlling. So for assessing video game characteristics, we're really straightforward and it was all self-reported. And lastly, for our last part of our scale, um, for flow gratification and enjoyment, uh, some things for flow is are my actions reflexes, so that goes back to being kind of automatic in your movements and control and stuff like that. Uh, for gratification, it, I feel successful when I overcame obstacles in the game, so that's going back to achieving tasks uh, during the game and kind of looking back on that. And then lastly, enjoyment. Um, I think this game is a fun, is fun, so just enjoying the game in that moment. Uh, yeah. So it's important to go over the reliability. All these scales, it shows us how much error we had in measuring them. And so I'm going to show these like R values. And a good, or a good R value is 0 0.8. Really want to see something excellent, just 0.9 or higher. And 0.7 would be acceptable. Anything lower than that is pretty poor. So we can see for our personality reliabilities, neuroticism was our highest one, and it was only 0.7, so it was 
acceptable, but not great. And we see ones such as openness and fantasy, which is below 0.5. That means we had a lot of error when we were measuring these. You were deleting some of the items um, in case they did increase their liability. Also, if we were to delete the item, we had to have a reason for deleting it. So like finding a reason why it could be confusing to the person. Thankfully, though, for full gratification and enjoyment, we had higher liabilities, all kind of right around 0.8 which is in that good range. And we did delete one item from each of those scales. So I want to go over an example of some of the bad items we deleted so you know kind of our process for deleting them. So for the extra version scale, we deleted this item that said I don't consider myself especially lighthearted. And there was some confusion on the definition of lighthearted that kind of varied from person to person, put a lot more air into it. So deleting this item increased the liability of the extra version scale. And for enjoyment, this item, I feel bored while playing the game. We deleted that because we're asking for these questions based on their favorite games. We didn't see much variability in it because it doesn't really make sense to feel bored while you're playing your favorite game. Uh, so our participants consisted of 115 college students that we sampled here using an online survey that we put out through social media. Um, of the majority of uh, was women, and that was 52 percent. Of the 115, 98 of them did play video games. And we had an age range from about 18 years old to 32 with a mean age of 19 years old. And so to summarize, we were using personality and video game characteristics as predictors of the intensity and the frequency of falling into flow and a sense of gratification and enjoyment while playing one's favorite video game. And so we didn't have too many significant results for personality, but I mean, we are going to discuss a couple. So some of the predictors that we had uh, was fantasy, and that goes into the relationships with enjoyment and gratification. So being able to relate to those characters in that moment, kind of being able to enjoy that character. Um, and then for gratification, kind of his the task that he's completed or her has completed throughout the game and kind of being gratified with that. Next, uh, openness uh, had a correlation of about moderate. Um, and this kind of goes back to enjoying uh, art and being curious about art. So a lot of games now are visually stunning, and so they want to they enjoy the game more. They're more uh, openness on that scale. Now, in contrast to personality, we did find a, a wide variety of sig significant correlations between the characteristics of one's favorite video game and these three states. So for predicting flow, we found that reward features was our strongest predictor. And that kind of goes back into um, receiving re these rewards and staying motivated to keep playing and keep going on throughout the game. Next, there was audio, so being able to kind of dive into the game and have that extra sense that keeps you focused in that game rather than focusing on other things around you. And then for character identification, being able to identify with the character and kind of see what's going to happen next so you stay motivated to keep playing the game. And for predicting enjoyment, visuals was our strongest predictor. Video games these days are becoming more and more visually stunning. For example, if you're aware of Red Dead Redemption or Horizon Zero Dawn, these are games that when you look at them, you're kind of in awe of what you're seeing. They can even be taken to like new planets, new areas you've never seen before, and they can just really stun you. So in the moment, you enjoy it more because of these amazing visuals. And again, we see reward features for a correlation. And the reason why we think it predicted enjoyment is because if you receive a new reward, maybe like a new weapon or maybe a new outfit, when you're, the first time you use it in that game, you're kind of more excited to use it and enjoy it a little bit more. But that is fleeting because um, the reward does kind of get old after a little bit until you get a new one. And for character identification, uh, this is another correlation we found. And it's like if you're really identifying and relating to the character you're playing as, you can just step inside their shoes and be them um, while you play the video game. You can enjoy it a little bit more. Something that was really interesting we found was nostalgia. So we started because it wasn't a very strong correlation. But it only correlated with enjoyment, did not correlate with gratification or flow. Our hypothesis was that it was going to correlate with all three. But we found for like games that do have nostalgia, like Star Wars, um, Super Mario Brothers, or Pokemon, the nostalgia part of it only really helps you enjoy it more in the moment. But you need more of these characteristics to create a really well-rounded game that also has <coughs> flow and gratification. Now, for gratification, we found that reward features uh, was the strongest predictor. And we also see that reward features is consistent between all three, flow, enjoyment, and gratification. And when we're looking at this uh, 
gratification, we see reward features as a feeling of pride. And the moment where you beat a video game, and you can tell your friends, you know, have those bragging rights that you beat a game or you unlocked a new level and such, that's the moment that we saw for reward features and gratification. We also see that visuals is a, there you go. We also see that visuals is consistent between enjoyment and gratification. And lastly, we see that character identification is also consistent between all three forms. Uh, so some implications that we had, especially for game designers, is maximizing these states of flow, gratification, and enjoyment by using these uh, game characteristics. For like example, rewards. Uh, right now, something that's really big is battle passes. So um, having set challenges that you can gain rewards from it over time while playing the game. And then character identification, being able to kind of uh, develop a well-rounded character so gamers will enjoy this game and will want to see what happens next. And then for audio, being able to see the importance of audio in the game. So like, Uh, we um, example before is uh, the footsteps in video games to know where other people are located and then for visuals kind of making the game visually stunning and stimulated uh, so that way uh, gamers can enjoy it more. Now when we're applying these results to gamers themselves we want them to be aware of the characteristics of their game that helps them fall into flow and being gratified with that game and for instance if someone does seek out the reward features or if they know the reward features is very pleasing to them, we want them to be aware of that and we want them to keep pursuing those reward features within those games. In addition, we want video gamers to outreach and explore on their video game library. For instance, if there is someone that likes uh, Super Mario Brothers, for instance, if there's one particular game that they like, we want them to explore and find out that there's a whole franchise within Super Mario Brothers and even look for similar games within the same developers, such as Nintendo, for this example. So we did have some limitations for our study, and a big one came off of the short version of the Big Five personality, because it had such low reliabilities uh, for measuring those subscales, and this really dampened the correlations between personality and flow, gratification, and enjoyment. It doesn't mean that those correlations don't exist or aren't significant. It means that we didn't find them because of our measurement error. For example, going back to uh, reliability for the fantasy subscale, the reliability was 0.46. This kind of represents a theoretical limit for what correlation we can find. And then for the correlation with fantasy and enjoyment, we found that it was 0.4. So it was kind of near the theoretical limit. This might mean that the correlation is actually higher, but we're unsure and this would require further research. And also we had a limitation based off of the sections in the survey. Our personality section um, was the first one in our survey. We think a lot of our participants were excited but a video game survey, and they walk into it like, what are these questions about personality for? So they either didn't take them seriously, they skipped them, or they just quit out. And you'll notice uh, for enjoyment, the number right after R is our sample size for our enjoyment at 43, and we had over 100 people in our study, and only 43 people were answering those questions. We only got measurements of flow, gratification, and enjoyment based off of their favorite video game, and this means they're only seeing high levels of flow, gratification, and enjoyment. And to have an overall good prediction of it, we need to see low levels of those as well. And our study was just correlational to a set of a survey, so we didn't manipulate anything. So we can't really infer any cause and effect relationships. So for future research, we want to work on revising the survey, work on the placement of the personality section, maybe move it around to try and keep them interested for the entire survey and take every item seriously. We want to use maybe the original Big Five, or at least have more items for each of our subscales for personality. So we only have five items for each of those personality subscales, and when you increase items, it should increase reliability. And that should also then increase the correlations. We also want to look at predicting playtime and in-game purchases. These would be really good implications for game developers, especially for in-game purchases, because there are some free games out now, like for, uh, Fortnite and Apex Legends, and they completely rely on in-game purchases in order for them to make money. We also want to look at the dark side of flow. So we just focused on what kind of positive comes out of flow, like a better game experience, making um, quick decisions. But flow can also lead to bad things such as addiction. So that is the other side we could look at. We're also looking at flow in athletics, sport games, and musical performance, seeing if what we found 
with flow, gratification, and enjoyment, it kind of matches those. And finally, do an experimental study so we can start to infer cause and reflect uh, relationships. And also, if we choose the game that they're playing, we might also see lower levels of flow, gratification, and enjoyment to have overall more, more variance there to have a better prediction. Uh, these are our, our references. I'd like to thank you guys all for coming out and giving us your time. Do you guys have any questions? Question there? Um, uh, I was just um, uh, wondering if uh, whenever the character identification, since most uh, video games are designed for generally young males, and the uh, gender is starting to level out and to equal up women playing games and men playing games, do you think that um, more women roles and more different, less sexualized characters for women in video games will change um, a relationship with character identification for you know, female question or not? Uh, we're starting to see, you know, the intersections coming into the games, like being, whether it's gender or if it's race or whatnot, and one way I've seen some developers tackle it is having open world games that let you customize your character. That's one of the ways that we saw it. Um, to answer that, I do see more diversity coming into the roles of the characters. Uh, but I think that customizing your character, picking your own gender, picking your own race, that's probably the best way to really, um, to really conquer that stereotype of you have the masculine man or you have the woman with the big breasts or you know the curves and things like that. It really depends on the gamer who's playing, I would say. Yes? Um, so did you notice the difference between like people being or being more on the flow with like single player games versus multiplayer games? Because some of the like top correlations you had are much more into like single player games with visuals, <coughs> like rewards and like audio and character customization, where a lot of multiplayer games, the character customization and some of the other things aren't as big because the multiplayer experience is a more important thing? We did compare multiplayer and solo games to each other, and we didn't find a difference between them. Uh, it would be interesting, though, to, instead of measuring full graphic and enjoyment, see, measure like visuals or some of the other things you mentioned between solo and multiplayer, see if there's a difference there. But we didn't find anything. Yeah, I think, I think a complication of that is that there's some games that have both. For instance, Call of Duty, you can play it by yourself you know, on missions and such, but then there's also the online multiplayer version. And so we didn't account for that for some games. When coming when coming across these games, we really let the participants pick their favorite game, and we really base it off of their answer. Do you think, <clears throat> do you think with virtual reality and stuff, and games coming out like that, it's gonna introduce a higher flow into the gaming industry? I definitely feel like virtual reality will with higher levels of flow because you kind of come out of flow if you're distracted by something else. It's so like we had audio, audio related to flow because it kind of helps you get in the zone by getting the other sense involved. Virtual reality, you kind of can't escape the reality of the game. And it's a lot harder to, so I would expect higher levels of flow. I think we see, yeah, we see that character identification is one of the bigger predictors of flow. And I mean, who more can you identify with than yourself? So then if you're playing that virtual reality in first person, that might increase the chances of flow. So is there less flow if people are playing a smaller device than? Um, so we did look at um, different platforms. So we did look at mobile games um, and different consoles as well as PC. And we didn't find any statistically significant relationships on that. So yeah. It's probably because we had a really low sample size of those who actually had their favorite game be on the phone. If we had a larger sample size, I'd expect to see maybe some differences, but we don't know. Any more questions? Cool. cool. Thank you.